Hello. Good morning, Chetan sir. Good morning, Avinash sir. Hi, how are you? So, I think Chetan sir, please start out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's fine. I think uh, Manish sir is also with us just now. Uh, so, basically, um, the topic is market and macro. The money manager who thought tomorrow. Before that, uh, just a brief introduction of myself. Uh, I've been associated with the financial services industry for around uh, two decades, twenty years, um, and I've worked with. a few banks and an asset management company in the financial services space here obviously the this, the wealth mogul is a financial literacy initiative and i believe that the fiduciary aspect of investments also has to be covered and the client interest has to be seen and uh, the financial jargon has to be explained to them so this is that kind of initiative uh, i firmly believe in asset allocation and i also believe in the terminology that one size doesn't fit all one person's portion may be another's poison so that's what we are trying to advocate and make people learn about risk tolerance asset allocation and financial jargon uh, but today obviously the focus is not on me we have a we have two speakers with us avinash sir and manish sir before that i would like uh, sanchit you can give your intro also yeah so i would just like to take it out but yeah pehle intro de dete so i think good morning good evening i think apni good evening and good night to ho jayegi to hum so jayenge but yes so my name is sanchit uh, i am the independent director in the kedia capital services Handling out the entire wealth management department, or ye jitti bhi what we are doing here is just the literary part. So it's not any kind of an investment advice, guys. So we generally do all these sessions regularly so that हम सब के साथ साथ आप सब की knowledge भी regular grow होती रहे. So it's more on a literary, informal and kind of a conversation, kind of a conversation here. And along with that, today we have Avinash sir with me. So Avinash sir is the founder and the director of the Profit Bar Securities, and he's a very renowned personality, and he always comes up on the TV news channels like CNBC, Avaaz, Z Business, and his research is always been phenomenal. So, welcome, Avinash, sir, to our room. Yeah, thank you, Sanchit. I think nice to uh, come back on the podcast, and I think uh, let's hope uh, you know all of us uh, contribute uh, you know productively to all the participants, so all of us can learn together, and obviously you know. learn from everybody's experiences i am also very keen to listen to manish ji you know on the macro side so i think it should be a wonderful session yes yeah. sir you are very excited to listen to that please chetan sir over to you yeah sir so, no, sejal uh, you need, uh, you can introduce yourself right so hi i am sejal sood i started investing in the equities market in january 2021 so i am the investor who comes after the crash and i have been trying to learn more about financial literacy from various uh, fund managers and experts on twitter i just request if there's some there's some background noise from some other speaker if you could mute please okay so that is there and i also try to host financial literacy spaces with other fund managers as well where we try to make finance more simplified it's called fist financially literate with sejal and tanmay and i've been trying to learn what we run is a peer to peer learning mechanism and i was connected to mr chetan by my very good friend mani so yeah i'm looking forward to learning from this session thank you so much yeah thank you sejal one second sanchit please just mute your thing i think there's some disturbance coming there sanchit yeah yeah sure 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 just just mm-hmm. mute your thing because one speaker at one time of the sure 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 yeah so uh, i just wanted to say that sejal too there's a youth a youth icon she has over a lack of followers on twitter space and all and she's doing this a uh, pro bono or free the financial literacy space where she's trying to educate people and all uh, at the age of 15 she presented her first business idea and she's a tedx uh, w- winner of her tedx uh, i am not a tedx i'm sorry to interrupt i am not a tedx speaker so okay. i did uh, do a lot of pitching competitions during uh, no 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 not tedx speaker i think you were a winner of some thing and tedx yeah 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 no, that's what it was a business plan pitching competition i've done okay. a few Okay. I'm okay. sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for clarifying. And um, anyway, still at the age of twenty, it's a good achievement that she's already into uh, content creation and uh, has so many followers and is into this digital branding and other things that she's working on. And she will get there eventually. I'm sure of that. Uh, so that is there. And it, uh, yeah. So we come to Mr. Manish Dangi. Mr. Manish Dangi has around twenty-two years of asset management experience. Uh, he's Uh, currently he is the founder of macro mozaic investing and research he was the ex co cio of aditya birla mutual fund and he's worked in the fund management space there he managed around 15 fund managers dealers analysts 
and uh, over 20 billion dollars in assets the the main thing is that he tracks the macros and the economy very minutely and not even uh, not only the indian macros even the global macros and i can just relate to you one incident from my personal anecdotes uh, from where i was following him in march 2020 after the covid crash he said that he would be investing 100% into equities of his personal money and according to our own asset allocation we could do whatever we wanted uh, but uh, if we were willing to take the risk so that call was bang on target if you look at it that way a uh, march 2020 after the covid crash the nifty was at around 8500 to 9000 later on it went up to 18000 and small caps and mid caps rallied 200% and this is not the end of the story from july 2021 to around october 2021 and even thereafter he told us not to dial risk that the macros were not looking very promising and we should go underweight equity or look at our asset allocation so that the risk can be reduced in our portfolio so that's been amazing and what i hear from the market and from other anecdotes even in 2013 he had advocated to go long on equity at some point of time and even in 2009 when he saw after the market crash so he follows the market very minutely so i think the first question to him will be from my side that what did you actually see after the march 2020 crash when everyone was scared uh, to invest into equities and what did you see again in august 2021 that you should exit out of the market uh thanks chetan uh, the first thing first actually uh, just to sort of uh, uh, for housekeeping it is important that uh, whatever i convey of course they everything that i say i believe in and everything that i say is what i practice okay so i tend to be an aggressive uh, asset allocator but i don't preach that to anyone it tends to be riskier um, also you know investors who are into dollar cost averaging or you know if you are doing an sip in mutual funds you know much of what i say actually is not very uh, fruitful for you because my entire framework is about uh, timing markets um so you know the very discipline of investing systematically you know that if you have adopted that discipline you must sort of continue okay with with that out you know uh, your question chetan is that as to what uh, one sees in any crash of course is is a uh, reasonable valuation um a lot of uh, um investors positioning actually uh, get flushed out and this uh, freak out behavior by investors sort of uh, is is well recorded over last 100 years every time um you know there is there is some macro uh, bad news you know which actually ensures that all markets get correlated with each other and investors panic about half a percent of investors actually invariably in most big markets actually get out of the market completely and that results in uh, uh, you know massive uh, you know illiquidity in the system uh, valuations actually get super cheap and you know that becomes a sort of fertile ground to invest yet again but that's not the only condition you know every every equity uh, guy would tell you that you no know, cheap uh, valuation is 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 a go to place i think you know the way i differentiate is that you know then not just the good valuation but uh, also the policy makers have to come and uh, reflate the economy you know so that is also a part of a composite um uh, or or the framework that i have uh, so until and unless i see uh, let's say even in today's setup you know when markets are crashing uh, until sort of policy makers come back again and begin to reflate uh, when i say reflate essentially means what you know lower interest rates or higher uh, fiscal expenditure or lower taxes uh, or better trade so some or other uh, reflation Uh, has to kick in so if both of them actually come together of course that becomes a great setup for dialing risk and and so if you if you think of 2009 or 2013 or uh, 2020 march um, the the crash was happening all along but then on certain dates you know it became very evident that policy makers were trying to backstop the system and you know that is the time from a macro investor standpoint uh that becomes sort of a point to pivot to the market you know and so you know this is what i would i would say you know i would have done uh, over and over again in in every cycle yeah uh, but manish uh, sir there's one question on that that uh, a follow on question which comes to my mind 
Are we in for a perfect storm just now with all these kind of fa factors, US tagflation, recession or slowing growth? Then we have inflation, we have central banks which may raise interest. And India is also at a premium to the emerging markets. So in the premium also, uh, we'll come to the India question later, but what about, uh, are we in a perfect storm in kind of the macro conditions for the global environment? So uh, Chetan, you know, basically uh, macro has a couple of parts. One of course is the growth inflation setup. Uh, we're clearly seeing uh, growth decelerating. Uh, both advanced economies and emerging economies actually are seeing rapid sort of deceleration, meaning slowing down of the of the growth. But then, you know, uh, this is not uh, yet a recession setup. You know, that is uh, people shouldn't conflate with growth, slow down with recession. Uh, 2022, you're very likely to see, let's say, even U.S., which is likely to slow very rapidly, most probably will grow at about two, two and a half percent. Now, if you compare this with the pre-COVID trajectory of 2000, 2018, 19, for 20 years, you know, U.S. was growing about 2.1%. So U.S. is still going to grow faster than what it did before COVID for 20 years. So growth is slowing, meaning it's halving from becoming 50% of what it was in 2021. But then 2021 growth was supercharged. It couldn't have continued, of course. And it also resulted in the, the, the pain that we are going through, which is inflation. We'll talk about it. But... But yes, here fact is that yes, markets don't like uh, you know delta, you know, so they are focused on you know the sharp decline in growth. But that's not about it. The real pain in the market, um, uh, Chetan, is about inflation. So of course, you know, every crisis, you know, policymakers respond uh, resolutely, and in this cycle too, they did. But uh, unfortunately, they erred on the uh, reflating the economy uh, way too much, especially the advanced economies such as U.S., Europe. Um, Australia and many other parts of the uh, world which are advanced. And therefore, because they have grown very rapidly since the uh, COVID bottom, uh, but, you know, the byproduct of their very rapid growth has been very high inflation. So just to give the audience a context that uh, if you were to see previous 20 years before COVID, the advanced economies uh, inflation was about uh, 2% or actually marginally lower than 2%. Right now in 2022, you know, it's likely to be about 6%. So three times of that. Now, that's sort of very, very hot, okay? And the key contract between government, policymakers, and the citizens at large is that, you know, you will not inflate because inflation is the evil that all of us face, you know, when we go buy stuff for ourselves, our real salaries actually go down when inflation is too much. And which is why, you know, now policymakers have actually flipped the whole argument and saying that now for whatever it takes, you know, they have to tame inflation. Uh, and so that's the setup we are living in. Growth, still reasonable, but inflation has become an Achilles heel. It is uh, it is a determination of Fed and many other policymakers, including ECB in Europe, to actually tame inflation, given that the inflation run rate even today is very, very high relative to history, to actually tame it, you know, many market uh, participants would actually argue that historically it has Fed and many other central bankers have never been able to achieve uh, sort of soft lending. Invariably, in actually taming inflation, they end up creating inflation, uh, recession, sorry. So, so in a sense, uh, while the data does not yet support that there could be a recession in 2022 or even 2023, perhaps towards the end of 2023, it could be. But then data does support that you will have to slam uh, brakes too hard uh, to ensure that inflation, which is straight substantially away from a sort of uh, median levels, you know, actually uh, goes down. So, so that's the, uh, Chetan, the macro setup. Growth, okay. Inflation, very bad. Uh, policy very likely super tight, you know, just to give you a perspective that for 20 years, you know, pre-COVID U.S. interest rates were uh, equivalent of our repo rate was about 175, 180. Uh, it's likely to end at three quarter, three half in about one, one and a half years time. So, uh, or two years time. So in a sense, the interest rates in U.S. are going to be about 175 basis points wider than what do you call it? What they've been traditionally over the last 20 years. Similarly in Europe also, you know, I mean, pre-COVID, you had minus 50 basis point. Most probably by 2023, we'll have 1.5 to 1.75% in Europe. So, so in a sense, interest rates are going to be tightened. Now, why is it important for you and me? Uh, because something similar would play out in India as, as well. You know, we should discuss India in detail. But then India's interest rate, like repo rate, has been close to seven quarter for 20 years on an average. 
you know, we are at 440, very likely we're going to get to seven quarter in about one, one and a half years time. So in a sense, you have a massive increase in interest rate in a very, very short window. And such kind of tightening we've sort of not seen in the past. And which is why all sorts of risk markets, you know, Bitcoins or um, Ethereum or equities, hyper growth, everything is actually coughing up, you know, all the gains that it, it sort of had since uh, COVID, you know. So that's the sort of macro setup, Chetan, uh, we are living in. Um, I will talk about energy uh, a little later, but, you know, I'll just pause here and, you know, uh, see which way the conversation goes from here. Yes, uh, thank you for giving us the global macro. I'll be asking about India also, but I'll keep it for a little later. Uh, I think, Sejal, you wanted to ask a question. You had something in mind? Absolutely. I, I had a question for Mr. Manish. So the question was, you know, macro indicators like interest rate, inflation, etc. can be considered lag indicators. So how will we know when the turnaround is near and the worst is behind us? So we can take an active call in the equity markets or did we just miss the bigger pictures? If you could throw some light on that. So Sejal, good question. You know, so most data, you know, by the time it's in and in newspapers, uh, in, in, in the charts, you know, it's sort of late. But nonetheless, it's important to realize how far have we strayed from the, the level of uh, tolerance that, you know, we all have with respect to inflation, which is why I wanted to give you a context of uh, an average of 2% or below 2% inflation in uh, advanced economy versus 6% or thereabouts on an average in 2022. So the gap is too wide. And, you know, we have a small template, you know, in 1970s too, actually inflation did rise to such a high level. And which is why, you know, a lot of people are reminiscing what Paul Walker did, which actually slammed brakes on the economy, crashed the um, the, the uh, stock markets and credit markets. And actually, eventually, he still took a lot of time. You know, you had a 17 year from 1965-66 to until 1982, almost 17 years of uh, law of inflation in the system, which is what... Um, you know, everyone in the world is worried of right now because you have, as Tetan in the beginning said, it's sort of a perfect storm. You have high energy prices for supply side uh, reasons, which are not going to go away anytime soon. There are reasons to believe because of underinvestment in oil, because, uh, because of ESG requirements. You know, there is a likelihood that both, um, especially crude, but also to a certain extent coal, actually the higher prices could stay for very long. Because what's happening in Russia and Ukraine, uh, it's likely uh, that, uh, um, what do you call it, food prices would stay at elevated level for longer than what we all have actually are ready for. You know, specifically because of the fertilizer prices, you know, which are uh, two and a half times of what they were about a year ago. So growth and inflation numbers that I'm talking of, okay, I'm not talking of what is already there. I didn't talk of 8% inflation in US and 8% in India. I'm talking of 2022 and 2023 inflation, even though I think that demand will cool off and supply will actually come online. There are reasons to believe that it would still stay higher than what we all are ready for. And which is perhaps the reason why, you know, we should um, uh, sort of rethink of the templates that we have been living in over last See, you are young and of course you haven't seen, uh, but I would, I would urge everyone to go through uh, what really happened. Uh, you know, uh, you know, a very old history was mostly in 18th and 19th century when you had massive booms and busts of inflation and that resulted in setup. Uh, you would be surprised for two centuries, actually equity markets did not make any real return whatsoever. And again, briefly in 1970s that we had from 1965 to 1982 for 17 years, equity markets in real terms actually lost money as well as bonds. So we aren't talking of a general IIP number or GDP number here. We're talking of an evil which has actually seeped in the system in the form of um, inflation. It's staying at much higher level. It, it came from, of course, a lot of policy mistakes from Fed and such like, and a lot of governments, but also it's coming from a geopolitical setup that we live in, uh, Sejal. The setup in which... Uh, you know, big sort of governments are actually, big nations are actually fighting with each other. Supply chains are getting cramped. Um, you have a real scare on the energy side. Likely that, you know, we'll have higher and higher crude. Uh, despite the fact you see this, that, you know, um, you have China shut down and you have uh, large um, strategic petroleum reserves getting released in US. You cannot have, get 
crude down below 110 dollar that tells you how tightly you, how crude is supplied and please understand that crude is life if crude prices do not come down you know forget about i mean anything can happen to us and europe we don't bother much about but crude is where we will boil because as a country you know we pretty much import very uh, 90% of what we require and crude is what food prices you know if crude prices stay higher food fertilizer prices will go up and that will result in very high food pri prices for us as indians and so both food and crude prices if they stay here higher then you know pretty much very large percentage of our population not just in india but across the world actually will be uh, will actually will have to slow down consumption and we will invariably you know have a stagflationary setup in the beginning and perhaps recession uh, by 2023 Right, and thank you. Thank you so much for answering my question. I'll give the mic to Mr. Chetan now. Yeah, um, Sanjit, you wanted to ask a question. I thought I will go turn by turn. Yeah, Sanjit? Yeah, yeah, sure. Actually, I'm just trying to listen to what Manish sir is saying. But that's really been an interesting session on the part. So, Manish sir, uh, I have a very little bit question to you. Like, uh, as as you Chetan sir mentioned out that you are the one who actually, being an economist part, you read out the macro level part. But sir, you recently been, you said it with one of the interviews as well that you be hundred percent into the equity part. But we as a financial or wealth manager, we always say this anyway that never go hundred percent into the equity until your budget says so. But to be on a lighter note, I need to know that sir, actually you being went into hundred percent equity or just like you also be concerned about being a proper asset allocation part. Raji, I said at the beginning, you know, I, you know, I move extreme, but wo mera iske aur aapka bahana hai, you know. So I mean, the way this is the way I, uh, I, I, uh, I conduct um, my asset allocation. Don't as wise. I'm a, that way is sort of a, you could call me from a discipline standpoint, you know, a little bit of a drunk investor. But that's the way I operate, and that's the that's what I'm uh, I'm doing it for uh, folks, you know, a small part of uh, their portfolio, you know. Uh, is actually managed precisely in the manner that sort of uh, um, I, I, I suggest. Look, what I do, Chief, is that I think, you know, bonds and equities, okay, are actually in some sort of a disequilibrium almost all the time, okay? I'm not married to any particular asset class. I think that, you know, each asset class must deliver certain risk premium, you know? Sometimes equity should deliver higher risk premium. Sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes when equity doesn't deliver, you know, for all the all the sort of uh, euphoria that we had for uh, for throughout last six, eight months, it's very likely that, you know, most investors will be very disappointed, you know, even though they stay in equity for very long, because, you know, buying in cycle peak, you know, you have a tragedy that, you know, you end up earning much lower uh, uh, real returns as well as much lower uh, risk premium over bonds. So, okay, so my point is that what I do is actually, um, uh, actually move from one asset class to another, depending upon how they are actually uh, suspended in some sort of disequilibrium. Sometimes, you know, I'll give you a small hint here that very likely, you know, since the last six, eight months, you know, since 10-year bond was at 6%, the whole macro was set up in a manner that I sort of kept pointing in various conversations, interviews, my post on LinkedIn that, you know, rates are headed to 8%. Now they're very close there, you know. Um, uh, Ten-year bond at uh, annualized right now is about seven half or thereabouts. You will be able to secure uh, seven eighty-five ninety on state loans and triple A's and such likes on ten-year. So very close there, you know. You're still, you know, very likely headed higher. But then, you know, this is the trick here that for an investor who is not necessarily, you know, married to an asset class, you know, can say that look. On bond, which is sovereign, is earning me eight, eight quarter. Why do I have to go to equity? Uh, what is the sort of risk premium available? Uh, so if you actually do the math of it at an aggregate level, you will realize that India's average firm earns about 15.5 to 16.5% of ROEs. I'm talking of last 20 years, median firm. Okay, They grow at about 11 odd percent. Again, very long picture also and short with the last 20 years also and last 50 year data also if i extract that's the sort of growth that they deliver for you okay if if india's risk free rate is at 7 and 8% then you know at current level of nifty you will be surprised to hear that the equity risk premium is only 2% or thereabouts so that means you know 
you you have a choice to make that you you take equity as a bet what is equity it's at it's about 18 20% vol asset you know so 65% chance or thereabouts that equity will be you know plus minus 20% you know relative to the median return so it's very volatile twice vol- as volatile as bond and infinitely more volatile than fixed deposit let's say but if it's going to give you only 2% more you and your dad or your sister or your mom may say that why the hell should i invest in equity if it's going to deliver only 2% and which is why from a timing point of view you may conclude that look it makes sense to be in bonds instead of equities you get my point so therefore for a timing guy it is not a time to invest in equity but again as i said in the beginning for a dollar cost averaging guy this is perhaps the re, you know the discipline of actually investing at every level throughout his life will perhaps make him well, you know reasonably richer uh, because you know he would earn that s- sort of sometimes a risk premium of 2% sometimes a risk premium of 4% when i say risk premium please bear it in mind it is over sovereign bond so i want to give you a small example 30 years ago when your dad was investing in equity and actually believed in this great idea of you know buying stocks uh, that point in time had he invested in bond at 10 year bond index fund he would have earned about 9 or 9.5% uh, in equity or last 30, uh, you know having invested for 30 years you would have earned only 2% extra now for to bear with you know 8 9 10 sort of bear markets you know many times markets falling by 40 50 60% you know was 2% enough the answer to that of course is no and which is the point i said in the mids that you know buying a cycle peak is a tragedy you know which is going to cost you heavy and you know it's not going to uh, it doesn't make sense but again if you're a dollar cost averaging guy it doesn't matter because in 1992 you're buying a let's say one cent and then you're buying another cent in 93 then another in 94 then you would pretty much average out and you would still on an average earn about uh, 3 3.5% of risk premium so so w- what i would love to do sachi is that you know can i stay completely out um of 1992 uh, bullish markets and then can i sort of go back invest all in 98 and exit again because of macro reasons in 2000 and then ex- enter again in 2023 exit in 2006 7 so i actually leave 15 20% on table but i try and capture 80 85% of the move of the market by actually buying valuation cheaply but actually exiting markets when macro uh, actually turns amber or red we also have with us in the speaker panel mr anish teli and mr anish teli uh, head squared capital and he's written the famous article which shook the i mean which shook the market in the sense of readers uh, in the economic times that why the ni- 2020s are sim- maybe similar to the 1920s and he gave a range of factors we all gone through that article so uh, maybe i would like uh, mr anish teli if you would like to ask a question from mr manish dangi yeah hi chetan uh, thanks for that uh, scary introduction but you know i i okay you know just to clarify uh, the reason uh, why we were looking at that uh, parallel was that uh, the 1920s actually in we were not looking at 1929 as a parallel we were looking at the uh, monetary policy of the fed through the nine, through the 1920s and it was as pretty much as loose as it was uh, not as Uh, not as loose as it was, but fairly loose. And uh, what they did was in 1929, when, I, when there was a crash, uh, they sort of tipped over the economy into a recession. And that's, and you know, that's what I wrote in March that you know the Fed has three options today, which is uh, that uh, you know they they take they bite the you know they bite the bullet and sort of start uh, increasing rates. uh they waited out for a while i don't think they had that option anymore uh but uh, you know so i think they've gone for the first option now the uh, the question i'd have have for manish is manish uh you know given your wide experience and uh, your experience in the sector uh i'm more of a short term question in the last uh, month or so we've seen 10 years both in india and us cool off a bit uh so is that some sort of a short term move or do you see that more as uh, that you see some supply chain issues uh, sort of resolving themselves and that uh, may cause inflation to sort of peak out i think the base case that perhaps markets are pricing in today is that uh, uh, you know that in some 
uh, form of the other the US uh, Fed takes interest rates to about 3%. uh inflation say comes down from say 8% to say uh, you know uh, 5% if if possible and then from there you know play it out, play it out from there i think that perhaps what markets are thinking or or planning or pressing in this point back so you know your comment or views on that hi hi anish so uh, I, one of course uh, it, it, it sort of move that you've had you know in in bond markets india we've had of course in 2009 and 2013 something similar in a very narrow window you know rates rising dramatically it that's pretty much a fate of all emerging markets you know you wait until the god out arrives and of course you know you have a very sharp repricing very quickly by markets and i you know most people who understand markets know it well that uh, central banks in emerging markets have very little agency on pretty much anything you know growth inflation and long bond yield as well as currency in medium to long term you know all they can do is few tweaks here and there and uh, the only mandate that they actually have and you know they should deliver is financial stability and nothing else you know so so that sort of that's besides the point the in us's case you know the move has been almost for standard deviation in terms of the rapidity of repricing you know bear it in mind that uh, less than 6 months ago two years at 25 basis point and markets were actually pricing in one rate hike uh, in 2022 uh, to now actually market making in three quarter or or thereabouts uh, terminal repo rate and and or, i mean 50 50 50 three times uh, uh, within four months you know so so in a sense that's unprecedented uh, that has actually led to a massive catharsis in terms of positioning um there is a sort of an idea of collateral shortage you know but uh, for this audience uh, frankly that doesn't uh, uh, you know it doesn't make sense to discuss much but uh, it's it's a sheer move on the upside has been so dramatic that i think some sort of a rebalancing should take place i agree that you know some of the data is starting to roll over as far as demand is concerned i think most commentaries in us that you've seen and even to a certain extent europe uh the inventory to sales ratios have risen uh, quite sharply uh there is also a case to be made now that the china is opening up uh there are ism indicators in us you know which are hinting at um supply chain is actually uh coming online and the stress is actually declining um uh, but that's in good you know bear it in mind that the ppi number is still flashing red you still have a uh, service sector our uh, sort of uh, in us actually is red hot right now and supply constraints are opening up there um while you know housing market is starting to roll over but i think the past inflation is yet to get reflected so i think the it's a, the picture is mixed but anish you know the reason why a 40 odd basis point of cool off has happened is because uh, it's on the back of the, the 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 rapidity of move you know as i said almost four standard deviation move in us market you know uh, some of it has to give way Uh, again you know people who understand and and manage money understand this really well that uh, much of it actually is driven by uh, positioning uh, and market speculative positioning in in bond markets uh, has turned extremely short a uh, very very short and so to a, to that extent uh, it, it it is a sort of uh, a move. this if you remember you know last year also very surprisingly bond yields actually fell off the cliff suddenly even in the wake of high inflation and people sort of started to think in 2021 that it was driven by growth scare uh while while the inflation was still elevated at 4 5% uh but then it turned out to be a false alarm and you know you ended up having both growth actually doing pretty well and inflation actually um uh, getting smoked further so anish my my sense is that it's technical and uh, i if if i see through it it is of course true that the peak inflation is very likely behind us especially in us uh, i'm not certain of europe though right now um i i am certainly of the view that you know the peak inflation is ahead not behind as far as india is concerned but that's a separate conversation uh, but that rollover will it take you to 2% what fed desire right now i am not so certain about it i think um the food energy complex which is which is the the foundation of a generalized inflation especially service inflation in the world i think is still flashing red and i would say that you would you know a year out you would still be struggling with uh, let's say not 7 8% inflation but maybe 3 4% inflation 
So you think it's peaking out, but but it's still going to be sticky for a while. Yeah. So I mean, see, look, you know, we are we want inflation in US and Europe at a fifteen twenty basis point monthly run rate. Okay. Yeah. That gets yeah. you about two percent. Right now, we are running at. uh at uh, at 50 60 basis point uh in europe it was uh, sort of certain countries it was even higher than that but that's to do with gas um again in india it's it's scorching uh hot right now so i i think you know this climb down i mean people who understand inflation understand that some of it, you know i think the fed did, uh, the at atlanta fed or someone actually put out a good study out there that of the if you were to see the 8% inflation 2% is the base inflation which everyone thinks 3% yeah. is is the inflation of supply side and 3% is demand side i'm very confident that the demand side inflation will roll over but i'm not very certain of the supply side right so the so the uh, inventory numbers that we saw with respect to target or walmart that's goods right yeah that's yeah, good yeah that's finished goods yeah yeah i mean go to indian hotel i mean any of the hotel today or yeah. cinema they all say yeah, yeah. there is there are queues there i mean Correct. it's like it's shocking Uh, but yeah, that's true. Pretty much across, and again, job markets are super hot. Pretty much across yeah. the world, you know. I mean, outside of Asia, of course. Thank you, Anishji. Yeah, thank you, Anishji, for asking the relevant question. And we'll go back to one of our another guest speaker who's been patiently waiting, Mr. Avinash. Uh, you, if you wanted to ask any question or give your views on the fundamentals, or ask any question from Mr. Manish. Yeah, sure. I think uh, Manishji, I wanted to understand, you know, that. Uh, you know as far as uh, food uh, food inflation is concerned do you expect some sort of a global food crisis uh, you know emerging in the very near term because you know uh, with the russia ukraine war you know hotting up we've seen uh, you know uh, products like wheat corn maize you know all these uh, products have actually prices have skyrocketed uh, fertilizer prices have gone up so you know what could be the impact of this global food crisis you know on the domestic indian economy as well as the global economy if you could give some color on that yeah so i mean uh, growth is a uh, uh, growth is a uh, uh, after effect of uh, stability avinash and you know stability comes from uh, the bedrock of stability is of course you know i mean we must have enough uh, you know uh, bread to uh, feed and if you don't have bread especially in uh, in parts of like south asia africa middle east you know you will have uh, uh you'll have riots actually what we saw uh, arab spring in 2011 i mean uh, india's emergency into 1975 you know uh, through purely an economic lens was essentially a product of uh, um uh, of the stress uh, inflation and largely the food food inflation then so could, would we have famine you know i have no sight of it but um, i'm really worried you know i mean people are actually mocking indian government uh, you know uh, basically curbing wheat uh, i mean i i'm i've written about it extensively over last two months that you know this idea of actually exporting at this point in time is uh, is not a very wise one india is going through a massive uh, you know a very very severe heat uh, wave and it will result in a, a substantial decline in crop yield um, you know i mean and then there is a there is a there are, there are studies of soil erosion and such like you know fertilizer prices as you mentioned um the composite of you know tpk of course is out uh, two and a half times higher and all that also would result in lower yield across the world plus the russia ukraine and everyone knows about the wheat and stuff like that plus you know what china is doing to phosphate you know it's not it's refusing to export you know the largest exporter of uh, phosphate same thing with russia very largest exporter of potash you know refusing plus the natural gas prices are actually resulting in perhaps even higher uh, urea prices so all of that you know, is quite ominous uh, i mean nation you know uh, again please understand and everyone has to understand that you know equity is a uh, equity or any risk for uh, for that matter is is sort of a game in a town on when you know there is peace out there you know you don't you don't play uh, you know you know growth movies when there are riots riots out there in gullies and unfortunately you know the setup we are in you know it it could very well not be true but you know the setup we are in actually is absolutely absolutely uh, uh, antagonistic to any risk taking at this stage uh, especially you know as, again going by, dialing it back you know to food again you know historically for 100 years a uh, crude is food and food is crude basically so if crude prices you have a site that you know you you want to see crude prices at 80 Six months out, twelve months out, uh, then yes, you can bet on uh, lower food prices. I don't see that. I, I I still see crude higher and higher over next six to twelve months, and therefore I still see higher food prices in six to twelve months. 
yeah i think uh, thanks a lot for this input but uh, my second question could be manish ji you know let us understand uh, you know the broad market you know kind of sentiment you know obviously uh, if food uh, inflation increases there is a food grain crisis across the globe uh, you know which kind of uh, you know uh, sectors you know typically you know from a market standpoint of view uh, would it be the sectors which would be you know prepare, you know insulated from this kind of negativity are there any sectors where you know investors can look at investing in these kind of markets or it's like uh, you know completely exit out of equities and you know uh, you know bet on the debt market because we are traditionally equity investors uh, and as everyone knows you know that every crisis presents some opportunity of some kind so would it be wise to say that okay there would be some sectors which would still not be impacted significantly by what is happening across the globe as far as food uh, you know crisis is concerned food inflation has gone up because uh, you know i have a friend in us uh, just a couple of weeks back he told me that you know christmas buying and christmas season normally the uh, manufacturers start stocking from july august onwards and because there has been a shortage of many key you know commodity kind of products from ukraine from russia you know this time us christmas sales could also be impacted so any thoughts on these uh, points you know from your side uh, so uh, basically i think i think in generally uh, high inflation or uh, possibility of higher inflation uh is bad for any duration equity is the longest duration long bonds of course are duration assets generally duration is bad okay but uh and the shortest duration are commodities uh sh- also by the way real estate is actually real and historically uh you know, that's the only segment which actually protects you from inflation uh pretty much all financial assets you know what is baked in out there is actually stable inflation reasonable growth um and and a very very low uh, you know not very high real yield you know so that is what is baked in in all asset markets um whether a particular sector uh, can do well i think the one which is uh, farthest from consumer um you know would do well because they will be able to pass it on uh, so the miners could perhaps do well even intermediaries could do well but the one who are actually facing consumer uh, are likely to do the worst the ones who are actually uh, whose whose most valuations come from future uh, distant future hyper growth and such like would do pretty badly and the ones who i mean in traditional uh, sense you call them value uh, perhaps could end up doing uh, reasonably well uh, so but in general uh, almost pretty much everything actually suffers if 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 you are actually baking in a rerun of uh, 1965 82 uh, even though in a short period uh, you know that's not a setup in which in which um, you know you would do anything well and i mean i, I understand you know, i mean if you're an equity investor only and you know nothing else your money uh, knows to dance for then fair enough you know i mean anything uh, you, uh, we will solve this uh, and you know all of these this is not the first time they'll be going through a crisis like this you know we 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 we've had this in the past and uh, perhaps you know we would solve it again and net net you know for a country like us you know i i i think 5 10 years out you know things would still be fine so uh, fine i think uh, manish ji very well articulated one last question which is very interesting you know i think a lot of other participants would also love to hear this from you uh, you know most of these new age companies you know like the zomatos of the world paytms of the world nikes of the world Uh, you know in this kind of scenario you know when uh, all you know headwinds are definitely pointing a finger that equities may not give you those kind of extraordinary returns uh, what is your thinking that you know uh, what would be the kind of impact on these you know sectors like uh, abroad you know we have seen netflix google amazon you know getting massively derated and a lot of wealth being dest- destroyed there so do you think the same scenario could emerge here because as it is you know these companies have had super valuations Uh, there are hardly any cash flows generated by these companies and uh, you know the narrative has only been stronger and the data you know which has been produced till date has been very pathetic so you know any thoughts on these kind of companies what could be the kind of near term you know or the medium term outlook for these set of companies i mean they are the riskiest of all I mean they pretty much sold put options you know uh, every 3 months 6 months out you know uh, to investors and uh, they they rely on Uh, you know, a, a reasonable climate to sort of stay forever so unfortunately you know they the, they still sort of continue to be uh, the riskiest bets in, in in the world you know in india as well as i mean more so in india because we do, do not necessarily we, we actually don't have uh, our own you know, uh, capital pool which deploy itself and mu- which is mature enough to actually deploy for very longest term so i think you know see any uh, firm you know 
whose existence was uh, baking in a continuous supply of uh, cheap capital or capital, you know, forget about cheap capital. Uh, you know, I think uh, they, 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 they have a winter ahead for them. I mean, we saw right in 2000, 2003, you know, memories are still fresh, you know, so, so many um, you know, tech firms actually went bust and never came, uh, came back ever again. So uh, my fear is that, you know, uh, many, many firms, you know, I'm not talking about the listed ones, you know, I think there's a very large VC market out there and they, that's going through uh, a winter. We didn't see that sort of winter in 2008, you know. Uh, I think we are pretty much uh, headed towards 2000, 2003 kind of setup uh, for, for these tech firms. Yeah, okay. I think thank you very much, Manishi. I think uh, this was really a very good input from your side. I think, uh, uh, Chetan, you can take over. Yeah, thank you, Aminash Ji, for asking the question. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to give the disclaimer that nothing being discussed here is investment advice. This is only for discussion purpose. And one other thing that Manish Dangi Ji has already said uh, that this is more for the asset, uh, dynamic asset allocation or strategic asset allocator. For the person, the retail investor who wants to continue with his tips and all, systematic investment or dollar cost averaging, he can continue to do so because for him it will be very difficult to time the market in that way. So that is that. Uh, with the disclaimer, uh, I'll just move. Uh, Rishabh, do you have a question? Uh, Rishabh is a mutual fund distributor and he's also well, very, very well known in the financial services space. He keeps coming on CNBC. Uh, TV18 and other uh, channels, ET now and all. So, Rushab, do you have a question? Rushab Desai from Bombay. Uh, thanks, Chetan. Uh, uh, Manishi, I, I had a very specific question for you, actually. Uh, I mean, we all know we cannot predict the market. Uh, you know, what is the bottom, no one knows. Uh, but currently, are we, uh, you know, there are a lot of news globally that we might enter a, a a slowdown, a stagnation kind of phase. So are we going to go back around that 2011, 12, 13 kind of slag yeah. what we saw? Yes, uh, yes. Or, or is it more like the the price and valuation compression what we are observing at this point of time? Uh, actually, brilliant questions. You know, I, I think very likely, and I've made this point many times over the last six months, that actually we are following a 2011 analog. Uh, an analog in which, you know, high valuations, a, a stratospheric expectations from markets, um, all in, in investor, um, because, of course, you know, we had absolutely phenomenal 2003 um, you know, meets with the current account, high current account deficit, um, you know, uh, basically uh, dollar actually uh, starting to sort of tighten, interest rates beginning to tighten. Uh, and of course, you know, we then get into, uh, we actually uh, have very, very high inflation, almost about uh, 11, 12% inflation then. And that results in a, a very quick bust. So the 2009 10 expansion, you know, just after the GFC was a very short one. You know, it started in March, April of 2009 and pretty much ended in December 2010. I think the market peaked in November 2010. So, and after that, you know, we had a long deceleration. And, you know, uh, people who sort of are fond, they, 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 they fondly remember what happened during 2003 7, yet sort of. Uh, cannot convince themselves that India of today is so different from what we saw in 2003-7. You know, it, it never, never happened ever again because you know, one after another, you know, basically we had the breakdowns. You know, initially high inflation, then of course uh, you had BOP crisis in 2012-13, driven by high CAD, then very tight interest rates. Uh, and so on and so forth. Of course, then the the demon and, uh, and GST and all of these things happened. So in a sense, from a pure macro setup, you know, 3.7 sort of never came back again. But you are absolutely right that the current analog, you know, that the markets, both bond markets and equity markets are following is of 2011-12. And here is the point. I'm actually starting to sort of get scared that we may be entering in a 2013 setup now instead of 2011. 2013 was a full-blown BOP crisis. People don't realize this, that if actually commodities, you know, particularly crude stays here and actually march up another $20, you know, we will have a rundown of another $50 billion of reserves in next six to 12 months time. And that would mean that, you know, you will have restrictions coming in on gold imports. LRS will be revisited. You will not be able to dial money out of the country. 
you will have restrictions coming uh, on lot of discretionary expenditure uh, you know especially the imported goods and so on and so forth so all of that is actually is likely to happen if actually crude sort of moves up by another 20 25 dollar so so we are very likely to actually um, from a pure macro point of view head towards 2013 analog you know but you're right that you know we are right now most likely falling at 2011 12 analog but then when you when you say that you know we might not be able to uh, invest abroad then i don't think the rbi is going to increase the uh, the the overseas mutual fund limit then i'm absolutely understand. absolutely no i mean people who think that you know this is a random thing that you know they haven't allowed no you know i mean in 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 a newspaper's mind it may be absolutely you know okay to think of 600 billion dollar as a huge number but then you know currency is a proxy of flows flows are very bad uh, we are tracking a 100 billion dollar of, of current account deficit we are very likely going to have a 60 70 billion dollar of bop deficit this year so an additional 60 60 70 billion dollar of rundown on reserves and in this setup you know no government uh, we didn't do that in 2013 and we are now going to do it that we will not promote you taking money out of the country we will not promote that you buy a lot of gold so if you want to buy gold buy today because you are very likely to have more import duties coming into you yet again so which is the i think you know i think your reference was 2011 was this only that you know 2011 analog gets you to 2013 if it's a full blown one uh, manish i i had i had two questions and if if chetan can allow me to ask these two questions uh, uh, to manish uh, yeah the, sir, you, you can make them just quick but uh, yeah you can ask yeah thank you yeah sure so basically so the rbi's commentary clearly says that you know even though they are in the rate hike cycle they are still very much uh, in the zone of pushing growth now don't you think this can be little contradictory contradictory in in the current uh, stagflationary kind of situation what we are expecting even though when the rbi is saying that okay uh, we would like to push for growth as well and my second question is that uh we are of course seeing you you did answer about the tech stocks in the in the us markets and and stuff uh and us have probably little more aggressively uh increase the uh, interest rates uh, are we among somewhere middle of the interest rate cycle in us or this is just the start uh the second one is of course easy that i mean we haven't really even begun you know i mean uh, us actually uh is likely to tighten dramatically but because of uh, the dot plots and you know the forward guidance um the trick that we have versus you know old watchers of green span you know who would barely speak anything now you know our market sort of uh, is shift in actually pricing everything that you know uh, fed would do so you know markets have already priced a terminal uh, funding rate or fftr of three quarter uh which is so from 25 basis point to three quarter so it's we basically uh, pre covid um you know the 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 us rates uh, was sort of i think 175 as i said in the last 20 years average has been about 175 80 so you know markets there have actually priced uh, interest rates 100 to 150 basis point wider than what they have been for last 20 years on an average but i'm these are average numbers okay i mean uh, we all began at 5 6% of funding rate in 2000 you know we came down to zero or there about you know about uh, a decade ago and then you know we've sort of survived there pretty much you know briefly in 2018 we tried to increase interest rates there but then you know very quickly a uh, recession like setup followed and you know fed had to cut rates even ahead of um, even ahead of uh, covid um, so i think you know there is a lot of tightening ahead and as of right now while markets are pricing three quarter of funding rate these are probabilistic sort of scenarios you know it's not very certain uh if inflation does not roll over um you know you can track it by 5 by 5 inflation or or you know 10 year break even so whatever i think if they don't roll over further towards 2% i think you know fed will continue to sort of induce volatility and you know talk hawkish um so markets are actually less worried of just rate tightening because you know they actually know this pretty certainly that you know they might not be able to get to the level that they are pricing in right now markets are more worried of the open mouth operations you know from fed officials that every week they come and actually talk uh, 
uh, talk up risk and talk down risk, uh, uh, talk down market, so to say. So, so I think um, uh, QT and such likes would actually induce further tightening. You know, quantitative tightness. I mean, uh, so which is why. Okay, so is is Fed sort of about done? No, I don't think so. I think there is a lot of scope on both sides, but you know, we ought to watch for. Uh, as far as RBI is concerned, uh, I mean, RBI sort of delayed as much as it could because, uh, because you know, of course, you know, as a matter of fact, that the mistakes uh, committed by uh, global central bankers, particularly of Fed, was of uh, of a different proportion altogether. You know, we didn't reflate economy as much as they did, and which is perhaps is the reason why India's economy, you know, not many want to confront this, but you know, India's economy uh, relative to US, Europe actually has done much worse. I mean, we are still substantially six, seven percent below um, what do you call it pre-COVID trajectory, whereas US, Europe actually would have um, hugged the level which they were at, um, you know, before COVID. Uh, so, which is why uh, I think they delayed as much. But you know, again, uh, I think I made this point in the beginning that central bankers in emerging markets have no agency, and I must sort of highlight this: you know, no agency whatsoever on their domestic policies. You know, they ought to do depending upon what, you know, Big Brother is doing and which is, you know, in this case, Fed. So if Fed tightens as much as, you know, markets are baking in, you know, you don't have a choice, you know. You can actually stop listening to RBI and simply focus on Fed and ECB and, and you know, that will tell you as to where our rates are headed. And finally, a small point, uh, Thief, you know, uh, India has a case of a massive fiscal dominance, you know, the 90% public debt and the sort of supply of born in India, both state governments and uh, central government, uh, it's too much, and uh, which is why the the long bonds actually can completely become unanchored, and which is why to this audience, you know, uh, while you all of you may be a a good uh, sort of equity investor, you must keep a good watch at bonds. You know, if they head to eight, eight half, nine, uh, you know, I mean, you, you shouldn't blink and rather dial risk in bonds instead of equity. Yeah, thank you, Rishabh, for asking the question and. Uh... Back to you, Sanchit. You had some question on your mind and you wanted to invite someone also? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I hope my voice is clearly audible now and it's not being echoing out, right? Yeah, it's fair. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, Mani, sir, I was just reading your article, The Profit Equation of the Macro Investor, and I just came across a very good question on that point. When you said that the whenever the government increases their spending pattern, uh, the corporate profits increases out, right? And Similar to like this thing, what's the current scenario? What you will say about when the government is spending a lot, even the RBI is giving the dividend part, which even the, after the recent news that in the last year when the RBI gave the dividend and as compared to today's one, it's being decreased to up to 90% in that part. And with respect to that, the RBI forest reserve, which they were targeting about $600 million, is actually being even decreased out. So in both the senses, the government are spending too much. And wherever we see the startup valuations is also coming up in their rising part. So do you think there is an interlinkage between all these things or is there being something which we call a debt crisis will align to it or not? No, I would request you to read this again carefully. I mean, I mean, I mean, too much is essentially, I mean, for an individual, the, the, the 40 lakh crore that both the governments together, you know, center and state would spend is too much, of course. But I mean, it, it, you know, as far as profit is concerned, Chief, you know, uh, mostly you ought to watch two or three things. One is that whether fiscal deficit, you know, is increasing or decreasing. Because when in fiscal deficit increases, essentially what, what governments are doing is that they're creating more money. Okay, they're creating more money and most of that money, if you read profit equation uh, carefully, you will realize that all of that ends up being with, what do you call it, corporate. And which is precisely why, you know, I argued in March 2020, if you uh, happen to read uh, my stuff notes then, that, you know, such a large fiscal deficit expansion across the world would result in absolutely massive, unprecedented increase in profitability. People think that, you know, the profits of the corporate came from, you know, uh, their ingenuity or greatness. No, it did come from only two things. One is that they uh, slammed brakes on uh, sort of paying uh, higher and higher salaries to their folks and admin expenses were cut down. But all of that actually, most of it, three-fourths of it actually, the studies on it came from higher fiscal deficit, you know, because when, when government spends more, it may end up being with consumer, but then the consumer actually spends on my goods and then, you know, it becomes my profit. Okay, so 
you do watch fiscal deficit and if you actually look at fiscal deficit everywhere across the world for no i mean there is no other possibility that all fiscal deficits are declining rapidly and will continue to decline until the next crisis hits us so government is no more uh, a, a profit entry it actually uh, unwind of profit so to say the other thing of course is that when the governments unwind what you can have is the private corporations and and households actually levering up you know so in a sense they borrow from the future you they, they uh, through the banking system you know they help the system to create more money and that becomes the profit of the companies now is that happening right now uh, there are evidences of this happening in in us there is no evidence of this happening in japan china europe and sort of there is mixed evidence as far as india is concerned so investment by households and investment by corporations either of these two have to pick up in a substantial manner if you think that you know you have 900 bucks on nifty and 970 bucks of nifty in fi 23 24 have to come true very likely it won't come true because we don't see a site of uh, major inflation reco investment recovery by either households or corporations uh, but there is a clear site of fiscal deficit actually coming down uh, across the world that will actually uh be a little bit of a um so to say what do you call it a, a headwind to the corporate profits that's totally true and understandable part that's why i can clearly understand why did you mention or that no kitchen always make the good food no that's because you know i mean uh, you know this uh, our you know our, our uh, self proclaimed warren buffett makes this point and uh, point over, over and over again that you know why do i have to get, go to any kitchen <laughs> which if my kitchen makes a uh, lot of food you know irrespective of the very fact that since 2007 for 15 years our real returns actually are zero you know we earned zero returns in last 15 years in real terms from nifty meaning you did not even beat inflation you did not earn um, even 50 basis point more than bonds in last 15 years So yes, our kitchen is great, but it doesn't make good food always. That's a very amazing part. So even I have a friend, Mr. Anurag Sabrawal. He is also there with us. Anurag, hi. How are you? You there? Hey, Jyotin. Hey, Kul. Hey, Sanjay. What's up? How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. So Anurag, do you have any question for the Manish sir to ask it out? Or any viewpoint you want to share it out? Sanjay, I'm just parking my car. Give me two minutes. Give me two minutes. I'll be okay. back. I'll call the next one. Okay, one second, okay. Sanjay. I'll just call the next one. We also have with us Astro Sharmista. She is a famous financial astrologer and uh, who's come on, who comes on Tata Sky and various uh, other TV channels and media. Uh, she uh, maybe many of you won't know that she's a aeronautical engineer from IIT Chennai. So she can literally take us to the stars and back. Astro, do you want to ask any question? Yeah, hello, 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 everyone. Namaste, everyone, and thank you, Chetan, for all the good words. And can you give me some time so I'll be back so I can talk later. Yeah, so yeah, by yeah. the time you can ask someone else to ask a question. Okay, yeah. Chetan, Chetan, sir, can I come in? Chetan, yeah, if you want, I can. I have a couple of questions. I can. Okay, okay. Yeah, Anish, sir, you can go ahead. Anish, sir, you I, can go ahead. My yeah, two favorite uh, questions, uh, two favorite thing. One is that we've seen a lot of central banks buying gold in the last. Uh, Uh, five six years, and especially in the last one year, I think today the RBI FI twenty two report came out where they've doubled their gold purchases. So I think that's that's, that's some that's some indication. And one is the view on the currency. If you have one, that was my two bit of questions as well. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So on the <laughs> currency, Anish, you know, my view is that you know we uh, if I, I think I sort of briefly hinted at you know we sort of. we are in 2011 analog and quickly becoming 2013 i've had this view for good 6 8 months uh and i continue to have similar views even today that we are headed uh, uh for a significant depreciation as far as our currency is concerned um see look the setup is like this you have first time since 1970s you know the big boys you know which is us europe actually are going through this trouble called inflation and they are also the ones who have actually pretty much recovered you know more specifically in us case you know you know pretty much fully recovered from covid they don't care okay so they understand this that you know the way to solve india's inflation sorry us's inflation is one of course you know tame us's demand but then 
incidentally if they are able to destroy demand from uh, emerging markets because uh, you know i think as we discussed you know that the chief problem of demand is not the goods demand you know electronics and such like you know i think that that will roll over the chief problem is food and energy and in food and energy the south asia and east asia actually count more than north atlantic uh, both sides of atlantic you know which is why if they can and i'm saying it's an evil design and i think this is the way it works is that if they can imp- superimpose massive financial uh, tightening on india you india china vietnam sri lanka pakistan bangladesh uh, and so on and so forth you know our we will experience a substantial slowdown and therefore would result in lower demand for these essential commodities perhaps and you know that would solve us's problem so my sense is that you know that's the setup that they want to create i think and which will mean that you know uh, they will have no choice if that is a setup that they create when they tighten financial conditions too much i think the only macro solution anish that we have is actually let currency slide uh, sharply because if you don't let currency slide sharply then resultantly what you will end up doing is actually tighten interest rates way too much which will actually hurt the domestic um uh, uh, demand even more substantially so i think the adjustment that you know our, con- our country must make and that's the point i request and i've written to rbi on this many times that we must actually um actually let currency slide very very sharply this is the short part uh, will so far because you know we have been attached to this idea of creating a 5 trillion dollar economy now the problem is that if you want to create 5 trillion dollar you know you cannot let your currency slide because you know even though you may do well like japan uh, is doing well but you know because their currency is depreciated you know they have gone back by 7 8 years so so you won't get 5 trillion dollar but you know you will actually have sort of uh, it's it's a net benefit to you and i and uh, indian so to say so my sense is that this, this should part will actually in next 6 to 12 months time if actually crude does not uh, uh, behave well will convert into will part and which is why i think you know your our currency will depreciate now on the gold uh, gold has gold's chief uh, enemy is real rate okay and because us real rates have risen uh from about minus 1 1.5% 6 month ago to about 0 to 50 basis point today uh and because fed seems resolved it is likely that you know this will actually be act- continue to break gold in dollar terms and which is why you know i i would say that about in 1 to 2 years time you know gold could actually very well uh stay uh, get stressed but then that's not a, that's not a idea for an indian investor because indian investor you know gold is a bet on gold dollar price but more importantly it's a bet on usd inr and if usd inr is going to depreciate we all know uh, for last 75 years that one friend which is actually has been has been in good has been of good stead as far as we are concerned as saver has been gold not because you know gold yields anything but because it actually tangos uh, whenever usd inr depreciates you know um, inr depreciates you know basically it protects us from that so to that extent i mean an indian household is wise enough to irrespective of what we all uh, financial consultants tell them you know they are wise enough to actually keep gold because that actually preserves their purchasing power got it in any thoughts on why the rbi has been spending i think they spent about 40 50 billion dollars in the last uh, six months trying to i don't know manage the volatility or manage the rupee in terms of any no, i said any any some of it of course you know i think it's 50 50 you know i think about 20 25 billion dollar is actually intervention the, yeah. and rest is actually valuation yeah okay. but i think at some point in time they'll have to just let manage the volatility and let it go in its direction which they, which traditionally has been the yeah but you know we made a we made a uh, you know our origin, i mean our cardinal mistake was in 2011 13 cycle was subir gokran and uh, subara you know at the hem of affairs actually let the currency actually uh, rise instead of depreciate in in the wake of 5% current account deficit you know that was that was a sin and that resulted in a bop crisis as far as india is concerned yeah, so I, got, i i i hope we don't rerun that we got invited to the fragile 5 club so yeah fragile <laughs> five <laughs> but you know i mean for this audience you know because you know there's so much so much gyan actually everywhere that you know we are absolutely super strong macro we are not as red macro as we were in 2013 but i mean it's not a green macro for sure you know it is a pretty amberish 
uh, you know, very quickly turning into red M, a macro. We have a bad macro right now. We are aware. We are, I mean, my bet is that $130, $40 on crude. At that level, you know, we are actually pretty much close to 2012's current account deficit. Um, growth sort of uh, pretty weak. Inflation very high. And RBI, um, you know, is now, as it was, it happened later then, uh, was forced to tighten rates even in the wake of slowing growth. So I think that's yeah. the setup that we may, we may end up. Uh, being there are solutions to it, and as I said, the macro solution to it to uh, to let the currency slide. Yeah, I think the the the, the point will be that post two thousand eight and especially post two thousand fifteen, there have been very very short and sharp bear market cycles, and uh, when we have a yeah. longer one, I think that's going to be fairly troubling for the, the investors who have actually been there for a decade. Decade is not short time in markets. But not something that we've seen pre two thousand eight. The kind of bear market cycle we've seen there. Yeah, but you know, I mean, I, I think you know the, the the folks out there, you know, must remember that you know basically, uh, I mean, the ones who invested in ninety two, you know, it, it it for fourteen fifteen years it didn't break even in real terms, and to date it sort of that money is earned only two percent more than uh, in or bond, you know, so. So in a sense, uh, and then, it, you know, again, uh, it's uh, people who sort of look back 50 years, you know, realize this, that uh, India tends to have a bear market every three years. Uh, so since 1986, you know, we've had 11, 12 bear markets, uh, whereas U.S. tends to have once in a decade. So so we are actually, uh, we go through uh, twice the boom bust <laughs> versus, uh, versus U.S. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Over to you, Chitra. Yeah, thank you, Anish. Um, yeah, uh, one thing, Manish Ji, I forgot to ask you is, I mean, we've already covered it in parts, but how are the Indian macros looking in that sense? Uh, you, we already know inflation is high and all, but some of this, uh, some of the market analysts still believe that we can reach a EPS of uh, 1,000 by 2024, and uh, they are assigning a 20 uh, historical PE to that, or oh, sorry, for, or forward PE. Uh, making, uh, uh, I mean, predicting that the Nifty could go up to 20,000. But I have a question in that. Even the EPS could be in question, the E in the price earning equation, and even the price earning multiple we give, if the, the market remains a little bearish, then that could also be compressed. It, it doesn't have to be a 20 multiple. So what would your take be on the Indian macros? In, because a lot of uh, speakers are say, analysts are saying that we could be a 1,000 EPS by 2024 and a 20 PE, meaning 20,000 on the Nifty. I mean, I see earnings, as I said, is, I mean, at an aggregate level, earnings come from where, you know, I mean, earnings, uh, earnings uh, internally come from leverage, you know, that either government leverages, consumer leverages, or, or corporate leverage, you know, so please understand this, that earnings do not come from uh, thin air, it comes from leverage. If you leverage the earnings to arrives, or uh, our current account flips. So basically, uh, when 2014, uh, you know, to 2015, when oil prices collapses, that's a 3% flip of current account, you know, from 1.5% current account deficit to 1.5% current account surplus. That 3% either can go to government and actually reduce the debt for the government, or it actually can flow into uh, profits. Uh, so basically, earnings uh, from a, a, for an aggregate macro watcher, you know, that I am, you know, it has to, uh, it is a it is a derivative, you know. I mean, you can't do bottom up uh, for aggregate, you know. I mean, the mistake that everyone commits is that, you know, e each company look at the guidance and then, you know, actually aggregate it and then find the uh, find the earnings. You know, the earnings of India, Indian corporate, is a product of uh, uh, macro forces. It's not an aggregation. It's not a summation of, uh, you know, what 2,000 firms are doing or 500 or 200 or 50 firms are doing, you know. So that's one. Um, whether earnings would sort of arrive, um, it may, you know, if, uh, if uh, what do you call it, uh, you know, if you promise me that uh, corporates will level up significantly, even the, in the wake of tighter interest rates and, uh, and high inflation and tightening interest rate, uh, what do you call it, uh, 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 and relatively modest sort of uh, uh, growth setup in the world. If they do, then yes, earnings may come. If con consumer le leveled up, you know, despite the scarred balance sheet that it has had because of uh, COVID scarring, it may happen. Or if the government, even today, actually chooses to actually spend even more, you know, at 10, they're, they're already running about 10% fiscal deficit together, you know, between government, uh, central government and state. 
what if they run another 5% current account deficit sorry fiscal deficit of course you know earnings will arrive and more earnings will arrive but in, if all of that is not there then we have a small template you know that between 2010 uh, to pre covid the earnings actually was low single digit or there about and which is why as i said 2007 to 2022 to date you know we haven't earned even bond yields uh, from equity uh, so that's on the earnings okay i am uh, i'm not very pessimistic i my uh, you know qualal uh, with the market for last 7 8 month has only be that you are too optimistic you know we not uh, it's not a doomsday scenario i'm making i'm only making a nuance point from earnings point of view that i think yes you have good but it's not as great as you think it is because the uh, the necessary ingredients are not in place but i have a i have a bigger and a rather more fundamental view on pe i think you know uh market completely misread you know that's the point i made for last 7 8 months that the p p is a product of of course yields uh base yields or sovereign yields uh india or abroad and as i said a 16% roe corporate you know growing at 11% with a terminal rate of 8% at 17000 of nifty you know gives you only 2% equity risk premium simple so if you are going to earn 7 and 1/2 8% on bond and instead you choose to buy nifty uh you know you're going to earn only 2% more are you okay with that you know then good luck to you but uh, but you know if you ask an average investor in india uh what is his experience last 10 years he's had a wonderful experience he's earned about 5% more than bonds uh he's earned in uh, return of about 13% uh i'm not sure whether he is he is dialing uh, equity risk of 20 uh walls um 20 standard, uh, 20 standard deviation for just 2% risk premium so but some of it actually has played out you know markets have corrected earnings have come up so the point that i made in july august september to a certain extent you know uh, is still valid uh, but you know some of the excesses have been you know especially in small cap mid cap which i was most worried of i think some euphoria has been chopped off but people have to recognize this that as i think i wrote it a couple of weeks ago that small cap mid cap and pretty much all the equity has a narrow lane i mean everyone wants to exit together and the bid ask actually widen dramatically so i mean for god sake you know if you are a three year investor five year investor one year investor equity is not a place for you equity is a place for you if you are a 10 20 year investor minimum yeah uh, thank you uh, mani ji for answering the question yeah nurab please go ahead thanks guys hey mani ji sab So uh, Manish, I was actually um, hey. So you know it's uh, it's kind of interesting. I was just pondering over this uh, over the last few weeks, and uh, um, you know we've been talking about 1920s. We've uh, spoken about the uh, dot com crash. We spoke about the uh, 2008 recession, and you know so on and so forth. But you know uh, one thing which is peculiar and you know kind of unique to this particular uh, uh, you know slow kind of recessionary period is that um, perhaps for the first time I. i think you know in the longest time that i can recall of a read uh, not just economic uh, there is a tumultus you know which is going on politically as well and uh, there is a biological pandemic as well uh, so economic political issues going on there are geo- geopolitical problems to be taken care of and um, in the backdrop of each one of this uh, you know different superpowers at this point in time are employing um, different kind of uh, you know tools to combat their issues now the issue, uh, in 2008 you know everybody was unanimous there was a recession in most of the parts most of the markets at this point in time china is suffering from a uh, you know lockdown that's why you know their central bank has kind of eased uh, the interest rates which, which is a hint other markets took and that's really one of the reasons you know why in the last week um, there's been a surge at this point in time what do you think the other superpowers as in you know maybe let's say let's say us uh, for sure you uh, the european union and let's count india uh, as well what do you think is going to be the first uh, point in chase they are going to address the demand problem the inflation problem or do you think it's going to be the political agenda that they're going to uh, get rid of or you know sort out as soon as possible because as news just came in to us back the first development that came in from putin is that you know perhaps he is ready to um have a discussion on the grain movement with ukraine um and mm-hmm. you know this is the first time that he's spoken on anything for the last two months or so 
So do you think this there's there's a unanimous thought process amongst leaders as well you know that they first want to get rid of the most important thing which is the geopolitical issue or do you think it's the demand and inflation that's you know worrying them more thanks so it's a phenomenal question anurag and you know i mean good that you bring it up because you know it's basically in most of these such conversations you know end up actually having conversations only with respect to monetary policies uh, macro setup growth inflation all of them are actually subordinate to something which you sort of pretty much you know summed up in terms of um i mean i like to see see them through the lenses of uh, a geopolitical cycle or uh, biophysical cycles energy cycles and so on and so forth and and you are absolutely right you know there are abs- no parallels you know until world war 2 uh, you know that you look back you know you actually see no parallel whatsever you actually see the demand supply uh, sort of problems occurring once in a few decades you know in, in, in uh, last time it happened in 1970s as far as us is concerned uh you actually see energy sort of mess uh, briefly uh, in 70s and early 80s and then only sort of uh, uh, you know few uh, touches of it in 90s during gulf war and 2008 uh, which actually was a real reason why why the collapse happened in 2008 but you know broadly you know we've been a we've had a sort of a surplus energy sort of set up over last many years uh, which is perhaps the reason until 2008 actually uh, energy prices the percentage of gdp con- you know continued to fall secularly throughout the century um on geopolitics you know i mean uh, uh, i mean i am of the view and for last many months have argued in various forums that you know this and this is not my view of course you know the folks like peter jehan and such like you know i follow and i believe that what they're getting the big macro geopolitics right is that global order is completely disintegrating and this war that is going on is not a war of some land it's perhaps uh, is the way the world disintegrates over and over again you know throughout last you know many centuries there are clearly two groups emerging one which is led by china where russia iran pakistan arabia and even turkey are part another western bloc which is us europe uk new zealand australia and many of us like india you know would love to be neutral you know as we wanted to be post world war 2 but you know you know that choice was not made available to us because these are super uh, bullies will actually force us to take sides and you know i think very likely we're going to take the side of a western bloc um now the thing is you know this is the tricky thing you know if the global order is uh, disintegrating then its impacts are going to be many fold you know uh from an economic point of view it's going to mean reduced trade because uh, because you know as people a lot of people talk of just in time you know resulting in uh, converting into just in case not because you don't trust china you actually trust china but you know from their manufacturing capability point of view but you don't trust china whether you they will be they will actually weaponize their supply chain you know which perhaps they're doing right now um on resources side you know i mean russia has pivoted to uh whatever it is doing right now it has actually resulted in what essentially actually raising the price of resources worth as a percentage of gdp you know substantially aluminum wheat potash everything actually has gone through the roof but i also think that you know there is going to be a lot of mercantilism you know look what india and government has done over last you know four five weeks you know we will ban wheat we will ban uh, sugar we will ban cotton if you ban palm oil we will ban this and then you know Uh, china is saying that i'll ban uh, phosphate you know russia is saying that i'll not give you natural gas and what not you know so so basically you know everyone is weaponizing you know and which basically means that there's going to be a lot of friction much lower trade and what does it mean for us you know it basically boils down to one simple thing reshoring you cannot trust you know someone 20000 kilometers away from you to actually secure that small tiny mini part that you wanted to sort of build a very product that you're building on shore you want that facility here in india or there in north atlant uh, in, in north america and which is what reshoring is all about reshoring or china plus one is not about you know evacuating facility from china and taking it to it, vietnam it is actually evacuating it from china and taking it back to mexico i mean for as far as america is concerned or taking it to east asia uh, eastern europe as far as europe is concerned so my sense is that reshoring uh, anurag would mean that the uh, cost of capital will actually go up because now uh, for let's say us which was actually bu- buying a lot of pig iron and actually converting it into steel wants to produce pig iron itself and that needs a lot of excess capital that means you know there's going to be more competition for that capital and therefore the co- i mean 
the 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 cost in terms of interest rate or in terms in terms of what you call expected return you know will all rise uh, dramatically also it will mean higher wages because because the folks which were otherwise working in x y or z place you know you, now you want them in factory because in that factory you know i want to make the pig iron you know because i don't want to buy it from china but that means you know that uh, mcd has to actually you know compete with the steel guy and actually perhaps pay 25 dollar for an hour instead of 16 dollar that it is paying right now so in a sense you know reshoring uh, which is a product of you know the original idea of yours that you know a disintegration of order um, means higher cost of capital higher wages higher inflation that is the setup that anurag very likely we are entering in and then you know you have a little bit of a pudding there of uh, uh, geo uh, of what you call uh, unlike 1970s when us ran out of you know oil the peak oil as far as us is concerned happened in 1970s very likely the peak oil has happened for opec and then very likely the russia's oil actually goes offline if they, we don't deal with the war very quickly and that will mean 3 to 4 million barrel uh, per day going offline and that will mean that the prices you know of oil can shoot up dramatically so so yes you're right that you know i mean for every investor get out of the bubble of just a monetary and fiscal setup and then you know big and and eps of 50 companies set up you know actually look around and you see too many red herrings as far as markets are concerned thanks manish thank you so much much appreciated thank you anurag Chit, and i think uh, is that all tetan um, uh, yeah, yeah we just uh, i think last 2 uh, 3 minutes uh, or before we wrap up uh, astro you had one question from uh, manish sir Yeah, hello. I just have only one question. Part of it he has already answered, I think. And thank you for um, you know giving the opportunity to ask him, um, uh, Mr. Manish. I just want to know the scenario wherever we are, the Indian market is right now. So, uh, what are the key key risk factors for our growth ahead? That's it. Uh, I I think I sort of uh, you know talked about it you know tightened financial conditions higher energy prices resulting in higher current account deficit uh, forcing rbi to tighten even more than what you know our growth conditions sort of require there are a lot of good things as far as indian setup is concerned our corporate balance sheets and uh, bank balance sheets are fine and uh, if the external uh, setup actually is reasonable then very likely will very do will do very well so for a for a market watcher it is important that you know in your neighborhood you know this lot of uh, noise which is in terms of higher energy prices or as i said current account higher current account deficit and what not all that has to cool off then maybe it sort of will suddenly become a very rosy setup as far as uh, equity markets are concerned yeah thank, thank, you. thank you thank you very much thank you very much yeah thank you astro and mani you had a quick question that's the last question here yeah? Oh, perfect. Thank you for having me. First of all, Jaitin Ji, and long time uh, Sanjit Bhai also. And uh, as you might uh, said, uh, Mr. Manish, uh, my my another question was already answered. Thank you for that. So you know there is one scenario that is you know as you right, he said that USA is actually sitting at the thirty years high inflation number that is of eight point three percent CPI. Europe having facing the food and energy pricing that is soaring up right now, and there is have been a supply chain disruption all due to the uh, China shutdown. and recent the world, the world bank statement about the 70 countries that are under the uh, under the sovereign debt crisis you may call upon and they could actually fear the same fate that of a sri lanka right and that is one side but you on the other side if you look up to that is resilient india why i am saying that because india have been on the verge of signing ftas with with european right and and we are seeing the historical fdis fis money keep on coming and going but fdis data i think uh, 83 billion dollars sort of right and on the other side we are on the verge of negotiating oil with russia at 70 80 dollar something even if you look up to the total 30 35 uh, 30 33% of the uh, food prices that have actually shot up globally but in india i would say that it just shot up at 7 to 8% so even in terms of fertilizer you were saying that in terms of uh, the russia have been doing this us and china have been doing this but recently we india has recently signed a fertilizer pact with that of jordan so my question is uh do you really believe that india is still better off from the other markets and if yes how we as a retail investors can take advantage of this scenario that's my first question and my another question is uh, given that is it still early to say we have already bottomed out given the war side war side scenario we are still living in so if you would love to answer over to you 
So I agree on uh, on India. You know, I mean, if we are perhaps one of the cleaner shirts in the world, you know, I mean, I think the only uh, place I would argue is, of course, still significantly better than ours is is US, uh, perhaps Mexico. I think you know, uh, pretty much most of Europe, um, the rest of Asia outside of India actually appear uninvestable at this stage. um uh, as you mentioned sri lanka you know very likely that many other countries more specifically pakistan you know uh, may go through a large bop crisis along with of course uh, uh, the food crisis and uh, and so in a sense you know we are relatively clean of course and that's one of the reason why we are still trading at a at a significant premium i would say 60 odd percent premium to emerging markets on an average um so and our firms of course you know continue to do pretty well we have also come out of uh, a good decade long of uh, npa cycle so i mean i agree that you know india's uh, india's uh, mac- macro is not bad my uh, arguments are not about you know pointing you know significant weaknesses of a country's macro my point is only about you know the difference between the emergent view amongst most investors that india's macro is absolutely fantastic you know that's not true india's macro is amber you know it, it high current account deficit strain on us tighter financial conditions oil everything is actually is not as red as it was in 2013 but it's pretty um, amberish you know so it's not great as far as fdi is concerned you know i mean it sort of has not escaped uh, the, the 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 ceiling that we've had for last many years you know i mean look at net fdi it's been there about the percentage of gdp sort of briefly rose after 2014 but has stagnated you know so don't look at just the gross fdi also remember that our, our economy is growing also so you know i mean uh, net fdi still sort of remains 2 to 1/2% as a percent of gdp not that great you know in the go go years of china it was 7 8% so if we want anything like that you know as much much space to sort of cover uh, and on on the other side of course fii both debt and equity continue to desert us so i think if you're looking at purely from a macro point of view i you 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 will realize that you know uh all of these are getting sort of neutralized and i'm not uh, i i'm not saying as i said you know it's not super right but it's amberish uh macro uh i forgot the second question that you said uh if you can remind yeah, me yeah so my so my second question was uh given the is it still early to say we have bottomed out given yeah. the war scenario so okay i mean i i i i think you know i mean i'll give you a quick framework of you know what i think when the market will bottom one is uh, when uh, the walls actually sort of shoot up uh, walls have been uh, across the world have been pretty low uh, uh, so you know you can measure it through wicks uh, so i i would like implied volatility ivs to actually shoot up significantly from where they are right now uh, so that you know investors uh, basically the uh the 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 speculative investors can get flushed out so i i i think you know you could call it let's say a complete liquidation so that has to happen hasn't happened yet uh second is that you know uh the the macro i mean uh, from the policy makers point of view they need to pivot again for growth right now they're only about worried about inflation so fed should say come and tell you that listen guys you know we have tightened enough and most probably inflation is in control uh so they should turn less hawkish and you could sort of gauge it through 10 year us bonds actually falling below 2 and 1/2 and actually going further down so that second and third is that you know as i said the macro is not that great and which is why as of right now i think next year we're tracking about 868 870 kind of P, uh, eps on nifty so um, in versus relatively uh, you know we are still about 10% sort of uh, uh, premium to the historical valuation whereas the macro is not that great so i would want this premium to sort of go away and uh, you know perhaps get a little cheap so so these are the three indicators i would watch uh, for markets to bottom until then you know you know i think the you are more likely to get an opportunity uh, at 8 8 quarter on 10 year bond uh, before you get an opportunity to buy equity yeah okay thank thank you for your great pointers and over to you mr chief thank you mani and i think a uh, uh, vote of thanks for avinash sir and for manish sir for patiently listening to us and uh, answering our question um, yeah thank you manish sir for coming over and answering the question patiently and i hope the amber turns to green soon sir on the indian economy 
yeah, that's yeah, a hope. I, I, I'll share it along with you. Thank you, guys. Thank yeah, you very thank much. Good night, all of you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you so much, Vinish. Yeah. Thank you to everyone who's come here, and we'll have these great spaces again. And Avinash sir, also thank you. Yeah. Thank you to everyone, and thank you, Mr. Thank Anil. You. Anurag, thank Astro. you, Anil. Thank, thank you, Anurag, and thank you, Astro. Yeah, all kind of fun. And guys, we'll soon come up with another session. And another interesting session to do follow our club, the Indian Stock Market Club. I think Chetan sir forget to mention it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, last time we had uh, Shankar Sharma ji. That was on a different topic. Yes. Also, that for all the youngsters who are entering the market and how in the long term factor he looked at companies and all. Yes. But today it was a different one. It was more on the economic point of view. And yes. uh, but that's had... a very interesting session today. That's a very interesting session today, yeah. and it's a worth while. And thank you, everyone. I think I'm going to end it in the next ten uh, uh, seconds. Yeah. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.